Good morning. Great to see you out. I hope there aren't any joy thieves in the crowd today. All right. Good to have you all out. It is good to be back. Let me give one quick report. Um, ah, quit. Um, for those of you visiting with us, uh, it's great to have you here. Mark's going to give you a great uh, welcome in just a moment. But um, I'm, my name is Tim. I get to be the pastor here, but I've been absent for two weeks. Uh, both of them unintentional and unscheduled. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I went down Saturday afternoon, late e or early evening uh, with severe abdominal issues. Uh, turned out to be an infection in the kidney prostate area. And uh, so anyway, I was down for about three days. Uh, bounced back from that once we got medication going. And uh, then Shelly had surgery on Thursday for her hip, which was scheduled, and that went perfect. Her surgery went really, really well. Uh, but about the day she went in for surgery, uh, because of the medication they had me on, I got gout in my left foot. So that uh, made for an interesting couple of days. And then on that following Saturday, uh, Shelly started experiencing some difficulties, and uh, I found her on the floor in the bathroom. And so uh, she was not unconscious, but uh, she was in distress. And so we called for an ambulance, uh, got her into Clovis uh, Community ER. Uh, Dr., um, Dr. Gabe, all right, uh, Debbie's son-in-law was on duty and saw the name and uh, took care of us right away. And the other staff there just did a great job. So Shelly was in the hospital Saturday night and Sunday night. Um, they first thought it was gastro, and then uh, because, the, the, are you guys familiar with a term called toponins? Okay, people who have heart challenges, they're familiar if you haven't. Uh, we all have toponins in our heart, but they don't show up unless your heart is under attack. And then the toponin levels rise. That's how often they determine whether you've had a heart attack or not, is over uh, every four hours, they will give you a test, a blood test. And if the toponin levels rise, uh, then they are pretty well assured that you had a heart attack. Shelley's went from 0.05 to 0.18 to 0.73. Uh, that was at 6.30 on Sunday morning. That's when I decided I was not going to come to be appreciated at church last Sunday. <laughs> And I understand that Fawn and, um, uh, yeah, his wife, Corey, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, did a great job, and I am so grateful for all they did last week to pull it off. And from all of us as pastors, we say thank you for your kindness last week. Very, very much deeply appreciated. But decided she had had a heart attack, and I didn't need to leave until they got this figured out. Heart specialist came in. Did an angiogram that afternoon, said there's no blockages, her valves are good, did an echocardiogram, said the heart muscle is working, but she did continue to have very low heart rate and very low blood pressure, unsure where that was coming from. Uh, figured out the colon, there's a little piece of our colon underneath our heart, which I did not know, and it was inflamed and it caused the heart, the lower part of the heart to inflame, which made the heart think it was having an attack, so it caused the toponin levels to go up. So then they ruled out a, a heart attack. Um, however, uh, since then, and through more dialogue, she probably did have a minor, non-damaging heart attack, all right? Uh, they are doing an MRI of the heart tomorrow in contrast, so they can see exactly what has gone on. And, uh, but the good news is from the surgeon that she did her follow-up with this week, stitches are out, she's not going through physical therapy, and she is walking great. So we're grateful for that. So about three more tests this week, and uh, hopefully we'll have better answers, but it's good to have her here today. So thank you for your prayers, your thoughts, your calls, your texts, uh, all deeply appreciated. Uh, now, let me direct your attention towards the screen for our morning announcements. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're glad that you joined us this morning. If you're new to our church, please feel free to fill out a Connect card in front of you and put it in the offering, and this gives us your contact information so that we can contact you with information about what happens around our church, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week as well. These Connect cards are also for our whole church family. If you have prayer requests, please fill them out, and we meet every Tuesday to pray over your needs. Thank you for being here this morning. It's Christmas time, 
and I'd like to invite you to sign up for the Christmas Choir. Uh, if you can carry a tune, we'd like to have you, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Uh, and even if you can't carry a tune, we'll help you carry it. Uh, rehearsals are Wednesday evenings at 6.30. We'd love to have you there. They're overjoyed and we can see it on their face, you can see it on their eyes. Some of them are receiving the gifts for the very first time. They feel so happy because they see things they have never seen. Through this shoebox, we want to tell a child that God loves you and he has created you. Jesus loves you. We've been able to touch the lives of children all over the world to give them a gift and do it in Jesus' name. Through a very small thing, God is touching the world. For the rest of their lives, they remember that box. So many children in the world have no hope. And a, a simple box gives them that hope. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. So man camp is next week, and this week is the last week to sign up. So if you want to come up to Shaver Lake, there's still tent space available. It's $25 per person, and it's just a chance to get to know some of the other men in the church, invite neighbors or friends to come with you, and it's a low pressure weekend, hiking, fishing, and maybe you set up a hammock for a nap. All the food's included, it'll be a great time. Sign up today, it's your last chance. Communion is a very special time for God's family to gather around his table with the cup and with the bread and remember what Jesus Christ did for us uh, with his death on the cross. His body was broken for us and his blood was shed as the payment for our sin. We never want to forget that wonderful gift that Jesus has provided for us. I hope you'll be able to join us for our next communion service. It's scheduled for Sunday, October the 28th in all three of our Sunday morning services. Hope you'll join us. All right, it's great to have you here. Thanks, this is a special Sunday. You'll hear more about that in the uh, sermon, but this is a special Sunday for one particular person also in our service today. Hazel Wright, would you stand up, please? Hazel Wright. She is standing, believe me, she's standing. Today, this very day, she turned 91 years old. All right, 91. Woo! And as pretty as the day you married her, right? Yeah. All right, good answer, good answer. All right, so that is so exciting. I hope you take the time to read in your bulletin about uh, Shoebox Sunday, Samaritan's Purse, and Angel Tree, which is at the bottom of that same page in your bulletin. Uh, we do these two projects every year around Christmas time. Uh, one, we want to help fulfill the Great Commission and the shoe boxes enable us to do that around the world. And then we also like to be engaged locally and we do that with prison fellowship and an outreach called Angel Tree. If you've been here uh, for a few years, you know what that's all about. A quick update for those of you who might not. Uh, there are a lot of children in our communities who have an incarcerated mom or dad or on some occasions both parents are incarcerated. Christmas is often the most difficult time because parents can't get gifts out to their kids and their kids think their parents don't care. And so here's where Prison Fellowship steps in. Prison Fellowship makes contact. They find out if there's a parent incarcerated that would like to do something for their child at Christmas and they sign them up for Angel Tree. And so in a few weeks, we'll be giving uh, angels away, all right? They'll be on a tree. You'll be able to go pick one. It's for a boy or for a girl. It'll have all the information about that child on it you need to buy a gift that's valued at $25 or less, not to exceed that. And you bring that gift, and it will be given to that child in the name of the parent and in the love of Christ. And so the dates, that'll be in the first part of November. With Angel Tree, we need more than just people who can help with the gifts. We need people who can volunteer to help in a couple of areas. 
Um, people need to make phone calls because we need to make sure that the address is right, the delivery time and date is acceptable so that when we deliver those gifts, uh, they get delivered properly. So people who don't mind talking on the telephone, we need people who don't mind delivery, all right? Um, and that is where on a particular day you show up, you get the uh, packages that have been assembled together in a large bag, and you've been given the address and directions, and you will deliver two or three or four or five uh, families that particular day. We need people who would be willing to pray, all right? And then also there are people who organize, because sometimes there's two, three, four, or five kids in a family. Different people are bringing those gifts. We have to organize them all in a cluster for the same family, bag them so that they all get to the correct place. And we don't like to make mistakes. There's nothing worse than having three children in a family and you bring gifts for two. Okay? So it's why it's important. So there's areas to volunteer in, in those. And if you'd be willing to volunteer, sign-up sheets are coming around. Please put your name if you don't have a particular area uh, or you want to talk to somebody. Uh, you don't have to circle an area of service. Just put your name and contact information. They will reach out to you and follow up. And then underneath the Angel Tree sign-up is Women's Wednesday Morning Bible Study that will start a new one the first week of November. And if you're going to be a part of that, they want to make sure they have enough material so sign up on that one which is at the back um, those are all the updates that uh, oh lost the pen to that one here we go good catch all right uh, I'll talk more about this picture at the end of the service. Those pictures over there, we had six Neonan kids left. These are kids we sponsor in the village of Neonan in Ivory Coast, Africa. This will take care of their education, their lodging, their food, and repairs to their bike to go seven miles each direction twice a day to and from high school. And uh, if you would like to help, it's $500. $585 for the year. Wouldn't you love to pay for your kids $585 a year and be done with it? Um, and, and anyway, that's wonderful. And so if you'd like to help out, I think we have six out of our 41 kids left who need a sponsor. Uh, let me take care of a couple of prayer requests. Uh, Tom and Dorothy Lutton, wait, wave so they know. All right, sitting right up here. I want you to be praying for them. Two weeks ago, their son had a uh, major stroke over on the coast, and um, last weekend, uh, they disconnected life support, and he went to be with the Lord. And so, I want you to be praying for them during this season of their life, if you would, please. Uh, Jenny Stages from our church. Jenny is a young mom around here. She has the two boys that run around here in cowboy boots and Levi's. Their name is Brody and Ruger, all right? <laughs> I told them the only thing better would be if they had called them Smith and Wesson, all right? That would have been the only thing that would have been better. I, I just love those two boys. And uh, she has battled ovarian cancer two previous times, and it's gone into remission. She's responded very well to treatment. Uh, it has shown up again. And she went to uh, the Bay Area and had surgery on Friday to remove a tumor. Uh, in fact, I think it was a couple of tumors that they found, removed them without any complications. Uh, they're having to decide what the next kind of treatment will be for her. And she came home yesterday. And so we're very grateful for that, but we do want to remember to pray for Jenny during this time. And say that again. Bodie instead of Brody. All right, thank you. And then Bob Pinion had surgery on uh, Friday. And so uh, a gentleman in our church has been part of our small group. So would appreciate you remembering to, uh, to pray for him. So just a few updates from what's in, in your bulletin. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering, and then we'll get engaged in our worship as well. Um, Fawn pointed out an interesting uh, fact about the offertory song. I love it, Fawn. Offertory, and then we're going to sing no matter what. <laughs> Sometimes the bulletins say the craziest things. You don't even realize it. I love that. All right? So we are going to have the offering no matter what. All right? But uh, we're also going to worship. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, I love you. It's great to be back in, uh, in worship at New Hope. It's good to be back with this family that I love so very, very much. You have blessed me for all of these years to be able to spend time with them. Uh, Father, some of that time has been through some really deep struggles personally, my life, their life. Some of it has been the constant celebration of the experience of life that you've afforded to us. 
And Father, for some, we're getting new experiences together as we learn to worship together as a church family here at New Hope. So it's good to be home. Thank you for the privilege of worship and thanks for the privilege of giving today. I pray that everyone who gives, gives with a heart filled with joy. And if we can't give with a heart filled with joy, may we just kind of sit on those gifts until such a time as we are prepared to release them with great joy and great delight because it's for your kingdom purpose. Father, we trust you with needs today, those needs that we've already shared, that's in our bulletin that we've talked about in recent weeks. Uh, we thank you in advance for your sufficiency in each and every one of them. For other needs that walk through the door today that we know nothing about, you do. Uh, Father, I commit them to you. There may be some who have no idea why they walked into church today. They just sensed that this was a place they needed to be on this particular day. And I trust, Father, this divine appointment will have more meaning to them by the time this service is over. Either the message in a song speaks to them, either one of your scripture passages, or maybe it just might be a kind word from a stranger they've never met before. Whatever the case may be, thank you for the way in which I hope you can use any one of us to be your messenger, to be your hands, your feet, your voice that, can make, can, that conveys the fact that they are loved by you greatly. Thank you for this day and all you have in store for us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Great job today, guys, even if you did screw up, Randy. All right? <laughs> Great job. You more than made up for it. All right? I have some good news and bad news today. Uh, the good news is, yesterday I got to officiate a wedding for a couple in our church, uh, Augustina and Stephen Smith have been married about 19 hours about now, all right? Yeah, it was great fun. That's the good news. The bad news is for all you ladies, Stephen Smith is now out of circulation. <laughs> He's married, all right? Um, those of you who don't know Steve, Steve's about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, um, he is broad in the shoulders and narrow in the hips. I hate to stand next to him anywhere. Uh, he literally is tall, dark, and handsome. All right, Marlboro man. Uh, you know, I'm short, pasty, and yeah, you can figure the rest out from there. Anything but the Marlboro man. Uh, but what a delightful, sweet, sweet time we had with him yesterday. It was exciting to be a a part of that. I've known Steve for about 20 some years and uh, Augustina for the last three or four. And um, so we certainly pray for God's best in their life as, uh, as they begin now as husband and wife. Uh, today's sermon, it's going to be the beginning of a new four or five part series. Uh, we kind of wrapped up with heaven. I actually had one more that uh, I guess God didn't want preached because I didn't show up. Uh, and then we had uh, Pastor Appreciation Day last week, and once again, thanks for all that. Today, this date has been set aside for quite a while as uh, a launch date. Again, I'll talk more about this picture in a moment. If you're visiting with us, we do this very, very seldom around here, but uh, in order to catch everybody, we do have to deal with some things in our Sunday morning services. But um, we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at two primary words, uh, the word surrender and the word stewardship. And I use the words in that order because as soon as you say the word stewardship, somebody's going to start thinking, oh crap, he's going to preach on money. D did I just say crap out loud? <laughs> it's not in my notes. Oh, mama, I'm sorry. Um, but um, you, you, <laughs> you, you need to understand that uh, stewardship is is about money, but it's not only about money. And so those are some things that over the next few weeks we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about. If that's somebody's phone ringing, you must stand and quote a scripture verse as soon as you answer the call. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I came across this very interesting quote. It says, when we put everything in God's hands, we experience God's hand in everything. That is good. So the question with that thought of mind is this, what in your life has God's fingerprints all over it? What decisions that you've made, what course of life have you gone on, gone in, that has God's fingerprints all over it? 
I think another just as important question is what in your life does not have God's fingerprints on it? What decisions are you making in life? What courses are you charting in terms of directions you're going to go in your life and God has nothing to do with it at all? I don't know about you, but I really do desire God's hand in every part of my life. And that begins with surrender. You cannot have good stewardship in your life without full surrender to Christ in your life. See, surrender is not just about releasing things and letting go of things. Surrender is also about redeeming all that we have and all that we have been given for the purpose and the glory of God himself. When the builders of a proposed bridge several decades ago that was going to cross for the first time Niagara Falls, the first matter at hand was how do we span this huge river with suspension cables? Engineering was not as advanced then as it is now, did not have all the modern technology we have. And so the, the building of that bridge across Niagara Falls began with launching a kite. A simple kite. The builders were able to get a thin string across the gap. Using that string, they drew a small piece of rope across. Using that small diameter rope, they pulled a bigger piece of rope across. Then that bigger piece of rope pulled a small cable across, and then that smaller cable finally pulled a heavy cable enough to support the suspension bridge. When the bridge was finally completed, it was a huge structure. It could support a train. It showed no signs of having been launched by a simple kite. The story reminds us that to do a great work that God has in store for us, to fulfill his great commission, we don't look at the end product. We look at the first step and the next step. It's often small, and I suggest to you, it's always simple. This is one of the foundational truths I love out of the Bible is that God doesn't complicate these things. He makes it very simple for us. The same is true with our stewardship and surrender. We often try to make it burdensome, but God intends this to be rewarding, fulfilling, and exhilarating. A few years ago, if you were here, some of you might remember a series that we did for almost a year. It was called the Believe Series. We looked at the key foundational doctrines of the Bible. We had a big, uh, uh, yeah, a big sign out in the pavilion that were rocks that were the foundational truths of the Scripture, and we looked at each one of them. And one of those subjects was the subject of stewardship. It's probably the last time I've preached on it. And in that sermon, I shared two basic concepts. Let me review those with you. Number one, stewardship is not about our money. It's about our life. Stewardship is about how we manage our time, our talent, our resources. It's about giving God not just the best of our life. It's not about giving God our leftovers. But it's about giving to God all that we are and all that he intends us to be. Jesus spoke to this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, when he said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. If somebody walked into your home, would they be able to identify where your heart is? I, I had somebody today, actually it's happened twice today, who brought me a gift. They've been around long enough to know that on occasion I enjoy a fine, it's my one vice, I enjoy a fine cigar every once in a while. If you were to come to my house and you were to open up a door and if you were to walk into a gigantic humidor filled with thousands of dollars of cigars, you would say, I know where his heart is. Now, you will not find that at my house. You will find a box about this size, all right? And most of the cigars in there were free. 
not where my heart is. I could live the rest of my life without having another one. But if you look at my closet and you look at my clothes, would we know where your heart is? Ladies, I don't mean to meddle, but if we counted how many shoe boxes? Scripture verse. Um, if we looked at how you spent your time, would we know where your heart is? If we saw how you spent your money, would we know where your heart is? Jesus said we will. So stewardship is not only about money, it's about our life. Number two, stewardship is about who is in charge of your life. Exodus, do you know what you will find in the 20th chapter of Exodus? It's a test. I've been gone two weeks, time for a test. What do you find in Exodus 20? Take a guess. Scripture, yeah, that's true. It's a good answer. Ten Commandments, good, all right. You will find the Ten Commandments, all right, in Exodus chapter 20. And the very first command, verse 2, is you shall have no other gods before me. None. The Bible says that God says about himself, I am a jealous God. I will not share your affection with me and another God. It's me and me alone. Do you have other gods in your life that try to govern and rule areas and parts of your life? God said, I'll have nothing to do with that part of your life if you choose that. Um, I believe it was Stuart Briscoe many, many years ago. I heard him speak at a convention in Southern California. And he shared one of the most profound things about the Ten Commandments I'd ever heard. He said the Ten Commandments weren't burdensome, burdensome laws that people had to keep in order for God to love them. Because what we discover is it was impossible to keep them all. Oh, we might do pretty good on eight out of ten. But there's usually going to be one or two all of us are going to struggle with. Briscoe went on to say, he said, the Ten Commandments were an explanation of God to his people of what God was like. Thou shalt not lie. Why? Because God's not a liar. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? Because God's not an adulterer. Thou shalt not covet my neighbor's stuff. Why? Because God does not covet. Thou shalt not murder. Why? Because God's not a murderer. If we wanted to understand the nature and character of God, then read the Ten Commandments. And remember the Old Testament was a period of time in which because of the fallen uh, nature that Adam and Eve passed down to all their kids, the Holy Spirit could no longer come live within the human spirit of God's created image. And so the boundaries were set with the law of, hey, this is, you want to be like God? Then here's the things to keep. Then we move to the New Testament. Once the atoning sacrifice of Jesus was made and once he was raised from the dead it was now set up so that you and I could be born again now when we sought God's forgiveness it wasn't only forgiveness of our sin that we were given but we were given the very life of God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit now indwelling the human spirit and now in the New Testament if you want to know what God is like where do you turn? Galatians 5 and what do you find in Galatians 5? Louder? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, kindness. Against such there is no law. That is the character of God. Lay the fruit of the Spirit down next to the Ten Commandments and you've got a beautiful picture of who God is. And who God is is also who God wants us to be. A reflection of Himself. To address the issue of who is in charge in your life. We must look internally about what consumes our time, our thoughts, our energy, and our resources. Stewardship is the proper management of one resources for the glory of God's purpose in our world. Now, this is not a sermon about tithing. How many sermons have you heard me preach on tithing? I've been here 26 years. I've preached one sermon on tithing. This is not a sermon about tithing. 
But let me just say a brief word about tithing. I do not believe it is the requirement of the law that is conditional to salvation. I do believe that it's an expression of faith as a starting point of grace-filled giving. You see, what we have to understand is the whole subject of tithing is not part of the law. The subject of tithing originated with Abraham long before the law was ever given. And the subject of tithing was what got started as a means of showing that we honor God with that which is first in our life. It continued on through the Old Testament. It's not referenced as a term tithing in the New Testament. But the scripture says Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. And he put a whole new spin on it. He said, now I don't want you to give because you think it's part of the law. I want you to give because it's part of grace. I want you to give cheerfully. And this is a starting point for us. Here's what I would challenge you to do on this whole subject of tithes and offerings. Study the subject. Don't wait for a sermon from here because you'll probably be another 20 years before you hear about it again. Study the subject for yourself. Study the subject from this perspective. Don't study the subject looking for a loophole to get out of it because you will find it. You will. I can give a good argument for it. Also, don't study it looking to prove that you should do it because you'll find it. Study it for this purpose, to find joy. Study the subject of tithes and offerings with the intent of finding joy and see where God leads you in that. Let me tell you where he's led me. Doesn't mean it'll be where he leads you. For me, the tithe is an act of love and trust in God because of who he is and because of what he has already done for me. Before Shelly and I ever married, she will tell you this was a serious subject of conversation between us. And we came to agreement together. We give to God because of who he is. Not because we're happy with the church we attend or all the decisions that the board of the church we are part of makes. We don't give because we approve of everything that goes on. You see, this keeps negative emotions from controlling my giving. When the church makes me happy, I give. When they don't make me happy, I don't give. Because see, I'm not giving to New Hope. I give through New Hope, but I give to God. So if the church I'm a member of makes a decision I don't like, that doesn't stop my giving, and it doesn't stop my joy in giving because I'm giving to Him. So emotions don't control my giving. I don't try to control others with my money. If you don't do what I want, I'm going to take my money and go elsewhere. Instead, giving has power over my emotions. Emotions should never control giving. Giving should control my emotions because giving is designed by God to be filled with joy. For me, my offerings are added joy opportunities to meet needs, to help ministries, to expand opportunities that I have the privilege of giving to fulfill the Great Commission and to reveal the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ in my life. Enough about that. Here's a story that I think captures the attitude of surrender and of stewardship very nicely. It's a story of a missionary in Africa who received a knock at his hut. Answering the door, the missionary found a native boy holding a large fish in his hand, and the boy said, Reverend, you taught us what tithing is, so I've brought you my tithe. As the missionary gratefully took the fish, he questioned the boy. He said, Son, if this is your tithe, where are the other nine fish? At this, the boy beamed, and he said, Preacher, they're still back in the river. I'm going to go catch them now. I like that boy's attitude. A few thoughts. I think the subject of stewardship and surrender begins with this thought. If you've ever taken Crown Ministries Financial Bible Study, if you've ever taken Financial Peace, if you've ever gone to Good Sense website on, on, on money, you will find this anytime this subject comes up. God owns everything. That's an attitude that we as his children need to have. 
He owns it all. We often speak of our possessions, but according to the Bible, God owns it all. We own nothing. We are stewards of everything that God entrusts to us. Psalm 24, 1 says it this way, The earth is the Lord's and some things that are in it. Okay, some of you know that verse. You're right, I misquoted it. It says it this way, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That includes your time and how you use it. That includes your talents and how you express them. It includes your money and how you spend it and use it. It includes it all. And by the way, since Christmas choir practice starts Wednesday night, if you can carry a tune in a bucket, 6.30, you ought to be right here. I want a 40-voice choir for Christmas this year. I think only 12 of you have signed up so far. So show up Wednesday night. We are stewards and not owners, so giving is nothing more than managing the assets and the resources. It all belongs to God. God gives his property to use for our enjoyment and investment. To keep this in perspective, God asks that we honor him with our gifts. And those who live by the ownership principle, God blesses. And just a side note on his blessing, that doesn't mean if you give, you'll be rich. Who do you think the wealthiest person was who ever walked the face of the earth? Jesus. Scripture says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills and all the cattle on the hills. And yet it was said about him there were times he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He had to use a stone for a pillow. It's not about the stuff. It's about the quality of life that we live in terms of riches. Just because something is in our possession doesn't mean it is our possession. It's his. I'll, I'll remember the first time I took Crown Ministries 24 years ago. And they taught this principle that God owns everything. And uh, there's an illustration in the Crown Ministries material that talks about a young couple who was taking Crown uh, on a previous occasion. And uh, they were in deep financial doo-doo. And one of the reasons was is because uh, the husband had just bought a brand new Mercedes Coupe well beyond their budget. But they learned this principle. He struggled with it, and he admitted his struggle with it in the class that night. Two days later, as he was driving through town, he got T-boned in his brand new Mercedes coupe. His wife thought, oh my goodness, he's going to be furious. As he got out of his car door and he walked around to look at her side, which is the side that got T-boned, he looked at it and he looked at her and said, hmm, if God wants a dent in his car, I guess he can have a dent in his car. <laughs> What a wonderful perspective. You and I must remember that God's ownership is permanent. Our stewardship is temporary. As the owner, God expects and deserves faithful stewardship from his servants. And faithful stewardship will receive a reward at the return of Jesus. He told a couple of parables about that. God's work should also be supported by God's people. The Great Commission is not going to be fulfilled by the world. It is not going to be the House and the Senate that's going to see that the Great Commission is carried out. It's not going to be our County Board of Supervisors or uh, the City of Clovis Trustees and the Mayor that's going to make sure that New Hope Church and Mountain View Church and Northside Church are carrying out the Great Commission in our world. It's up to us. Somebody revealed that there are at least nine reasons why people give, and there's probably more. But nine was more than enough for today. People give because of passion, because we believe in a cause. People give because of an affiliation, because we belong to an organization. And may I just say, I've been asked to serve on, on a few boards during my lifetime. And two of the things I always have to ask myself before I say yes or no to that is, number one, do I appreciate the mission of this organization? And number two, am I willing to support it with my time and my money? If I'm going to say yes to serving on a board, I need to do both of those things. It was very easy for me to serve on Nancy Hines Hospice Board because I believe so deeply in everything they do. When you affiliate with somebody, you should support. Tradition, because we have a history or a practice of giving. Yes, I have studied the scriptures, and yes, we've come to conclusions about what they say about giving, but I will tell you one of the strong influences in my own life about stewardship of time as well as resources was watching my mom and dad, was watching both sets of my grandparents, I watched how they used their time and their resources. 
it impacted the way in which I do. Recognition. Some people give because they want to be known. Some give because of inspiration. We are captured by the project or by the presentation. The kids of Neonan and Madame Elise inspired us to get engaged with a little village on the other side of the world. Sometimes we give out of obligation, out of duty or expectation. Sometimes we give out of transformation because we really want our lives and our resources to make a difference long after we're gone. Sometimes we give because we were invited to give. Um, Christy and Teddy Miller, they're around here somewhere. I'll never forget, they were attending church three or four years. They just came, sat on the pew, went home after every Sunday. Dozens of clipboards crossed in front of them like they do you guys. They never signed up for one thing. We were putting together a special emphasis one month, one year, in a, for a particular month called Make a Difference. And I wanted a couple from different age groups to be part of that. And they were in their 20s at that time. They're not anymore, but they were then. And, um, and I asked them to get engaged. Not only did they get engaged there, but then they volunteered for something else. And then I asked them to go talk to Robert about getting connected to our youth ministry. And now Teddy is the youth director of our high school program. And one time I asked them, why didn't you do anything for three years? And their answer was, nobody asked. An invitation. And last of all, completion. We're fulfilling a commitment. But truth be said, I think the best reason why you and I as the children of God give is because of our love for God. That should be number one. There are five R's to giving. There's regular giving, which is consistent. 1 Corinthians 16.2 says, On the first day of every week, set aside an offering of what you have earned and give it to the Lord. God directed his people in the New Testament to give according to specific, consistent patterns. There is responsive giving, proportionally, in response to, not in order to get a response from. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your first fruits, then your barns will be filled there's faithful giving or reliant giving. God desires that his children give based upon God's ability to supply their needs. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply your needs according to his riches and glory. There's revelation giving. God reveals a specific need at a particular time and impresses upon his people to meet those needs. For example, the children of Israel being released from Egypt and now they're to build a tabernacle that will travel with them in the wilderness, a place where they can worship and honor God. Once they're established in the promised land, God asks for them to build the temple and they respond. Nehemiah's wall that he had to rebuild, the people responded. In the New Testament, the needs of the Jerusalem church, because they had, had all ended up in a situation of near poverty, and the other churches rallied together to meet their need. And then the last one, which should be a part of all the other kinds of giving, is radiant giving, joyful. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Let each man do according as he has purposed in his heart not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God desires equal commitment, not equal contribution. Not everybody is going to be able to give the same amount, but we all ought to be engaged. And last of all, God blesses the giver in proportion to his giving. God doesn't need anything from us, but he wants us to grow in grace through our giving Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Luke 6, 38. This past Thursday in our men's Bible study, we're going verse by verse through the Gospel of John. And we were in John chapter 2, where Jesus performs his very first miracle at a wedding feast. The wedding feast in those days lasted for days, not hours. Now, the Smith wedding reception yesterday... Seven hour wedding reception. I said, I'm too old for that, all right? <clears throat> and, um, uh, but in those days, it went on for seven days. Halfway through the wedding feast, the father ran out of wine. Very embarrassing. So the mother of Jesus goes to Jesus and says, Hey, help him out. And Jesus said, Woman, what are you telling me? What are you giving me orders for? She knew who he was. He knew she knew who he was. And so she looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And do you know what Jesus told them? Fill them to the brim. 
fill them to the very top. Thank goodness the servants did exactly what they were told and they had more than enough of the best wine for the rest of the wedding reception. What would have happened if they'd only filled it half full? I suspect he would have still transformed it to wine, but guess what? They'd have only had half as much. I think there's a principle in there somewhere for us. How much of our lives do we give to him? How much is he allowed of himself to invest in us? This is where the surrender part is really, really important. There was a Christian philanthropist, I believe it was J.C. Penney, but I, in my research I couldn't nail it down, so I'm just going to say a philanthropist. And he was asked, how is it that you give so much away and yet you have so much left over? He replied, I suppose it's like this. I shovel out, God shovels in, and his shovel is bigger than mine. There's a story told about a couple of guys who were discussing their approaches to giving. One man said, here's how I decide how much to give. I cast my paycheck. I get small bills. And then I go home. I draw a circle on the floor. I throw the money in the air, and whatever falls in the circle is what I give to God. The other guy looked at him and said, you know what? That's not bad, but I think my way's better. On payday, I cast my check. I get small bills. When I get home, I toss the money in the air, and whatever God catches, he can keep. Stewardship. Stewardship is not leaving a tip on God's tablecloth. It's the confession of an unpayable debt at God's Calvary's cross. I think if we keep that in mind, surrender becomes a lot easier. Well, that's the message. The next 12 or 14 minutes, we're going to talk about that picture. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, again, I'm sorry. It's not what we normally do on a Sunday. But over the last 24 months, our church family in multiple business meetings, we have voted to do this project. It started out as a three-tiered project. One, we were going to remodel our children's center. If you haven't been over there, it got remodeled a few years ago. It is beautiful. It is exquisite. It looks wonderful. The second part of the project was going to be to remodel and expand this sanctuary. We got to remodel, but we didn't get to expand because of county rules and guidelines. We were going to, the price was going to double and we were going to lose seating instead of gain seating. So we did some remodel work, but we were not able to do the expansion. Brings us to part three, and that is uh, to build this building, which is a 60 by 150 foot building. The shorter part, uh, on the part that's at my right, your left, is to house our offices, which have been, for now, in 16 years, in a triple-wide mobile home, all right? Uh, we would be getting rid of that and moving our offices into that part, and then the 90 by 60, the bigger part of the building, would be a multi-use reception facility. We'll also have in it a full kitchen resource. And so at this moment, we have some brochures uh, to hand out. So gentlemen, if you all would get busy and distribute these down every aisle, I would like everybody to take one, all right? Uh, so they're getting directions right now, but you're going to be getting a brochure that looks like this, and you're going to be getting a pledge card that looks like this, all right? And so they may not, they're just going to hand a stack down every aisle. And if uh, you come up with some extra on the end, then look for somebody who needs them. All right? So I want everybody to take one. We're going to have more of these to distribute by next week. That if you uh, want to give them to somebody, you'll be welcome to do that. But I want you to get one in your hand so that we can talk about it and walk through it. It was only uh, earlier this year that we made our third vote on the project because we just wanted to make sure that no one had changed their mind before we started to spend about fifty to $60,000 with the CUD permits and uh, with getting the final uh, plans, all set of plans, the complete set done. Uh, and at that time, once again, it was a, uh, a unanimous let's go on this project. And so... Um, it's now time that as a church family we do more than just vote. It is time that we engage and invest. And, um, oh, thank you, John, for helping out over there. And uh, we have prayed and we have planned. We have prayed and we have designed. We have prayed and we've sought for your input. And we have prayed again. Today we're going to launch and we're going to pray some more. We will not pressure forgiving. 
we will present the need and we will express to you the benefits of this project. As your pastor for the last 26 years, I believe this is the time for us to do this. We are growing spiritually. We are healthy financially. It has always been my goal to have uh, a minimum of two months budget in our bank account. We have almost three, I believe, at this point. So we are very healthy financially. For those of you who may be newer to our church, we are debt-free. We have been debt-free 25 of the last 26 years. Our leadership in our ministries is solid. Our attendance has been strong. It's time, I think, that we engage at the present moment for the sake of future moments. So how do we do this? Does everybody have a copy now? I kind of just want to walk you through the brochure real quick, not to insult your intelligence, but just to give you great familiarity. Uh, you'll notice on the front page, uh, there is a projected groundbreaking. Uh, we hope by summertime, we will be able to break ground and get started. Uh, Steve Drake, would you stand please? Steve Drake is our general contractor, working with the city and the county to get all these things through. Thank you. He's also a member of our board. We have other board members in this service. Would you stand, please? I just want people to look around, see who you are. Mike Chen is our chairman. He's right over there. John Reelhorn's walking down the aisle there. Oh, you guys dress like pumpkins together today. <laughs> Ray Steele uh, just sat down. John Reelhorn is sitting down. Uh, so... Feel free to ask them any questions. Um, if you open this up, you're going to see there's a small diagram on the inside. I know it's kind of small, but I wanted to give you a footprint of what will be inside. You'll see the offices at the, at the, uh, at the bottom and the reception area at the top. Uh, I want you to notice the phrase at the bottom of that first column, Jesus is sufficient. This project is to be funded without a reduction in current tithe commitments, mission, or outreach giving. Do you get the picture? You see, if you transfer from giving your regular monthly or weekly gifts to the building fund, then how do we take care of monthly expenses? It's just like at home, all right, in figuring out the budget. So this, this contribution is something you have to pray about and think about as you make it. Then the benefits of this building project, they must connect to the Great Commission. They must connect to our, uh, our vision statement here. And I've given you a few examples of it. Um, by having better space for our children, youth, and adult ministries. Example, that new building will enable us to have senior luncheons that aren't crowded, all right? These past three or four, we have been jammed full. Some people have had to sit outside. This will enable us to have the uh, youth pie auction, our fundraiser for Mexico, without it being in the sanctuary. We can do children's plays and all kinds of decorations. We can have concerts, Christmas banquets. Vacation Bible School will be reshaped. We can have large family, church-wide family dinners here which we can't do at the moment. Second of all, this provides options for Sunday morning expansion venues. Our eight o'clock service, instead of being in the high school room, will now be in a new facility that can handle a lot more. They might get more frills and thrills than they do right now. Um, we can have a young adult worship led service at 11 o'clock and pipe the sermon over. They can have their own music style in a different format going on at the 11 o'clock service. The bridge, which is our youth room, it can go back to being a youth facility instead of having to share it with so much that goes on around here, and it can get a much needed facelift. We will have a full service kitchen to help us with all of our food functions around here, from memorial receptions to celebrate recovery to Christmas celebrations, vacation Bible school, pancake breakfast. Let your mind go wild there. Some bonus benefits by providing improved office space to the staff. And I realize on this page we have a few uh, typos here. We have too much space after improved. Um, number two, improved parking. Number three, having improved space for memorial services and receptions. This continues to be a huge outreach for the word us is missing. Okay? These just got delivered late yesterday. Um, and, and that's true. One of our primary outreaches in the community is through memorial services. We can put 250 people in here. We can only put 100 people currently over there. 
so this would enable us to service families in our community much better. It gives us a facility where we can do more training and discipleship from CR to grief share to evangelism to financial peace to community-wide things. It provides us a worship space if and when we ever were to choose to expand this building and we could not meet in here for a period of time, we would have a place still that we could meet on Sunday mornings without having to rent space elsewhere. Ways to give to this project, you can write a check, make a pledge, give online. You can give a charitable RMD, which is a required minimum distribution. If you are retired, you know what that is all about. If you have questions on that, you can contact John Longstaff. You can contact Mike Chin. They would be able to help you with what that is all about. If you turn to the back page now where it says new construction fundraising, uh, I've taken just a little bit of time to explain what professionals have explained to me. Uh, we are in the sweet spot. Some of you are saying, Tim, 1.5 million is what you want to raise. I know, we've never done that here before. But, you know, Jesus never turned water to wine before either. So uh, he did it, and I think he can do it here. The professionals say what we need to raise for a church our size, we are in a sweet spot. Uh, the perfect number that you're looking for is three times your annual budget. Our annual budget here is $900,000 almost. That means 2.7 million is the perfect amount we could raise. We're raising 1.5. So it is much less than that. Um, the, the numbers down below, this is just breaking it down into bite-sized ways that you can do that. And there's another mistake here. It says per month example. That per month example ought to be over above the 695, 280, or 70, all right? Um, in other words, we have about 280 givers here that give consistently. And so we did a little chart based on 266 givers. If we have 50 who give $500 over a three-year period, 75 people who will give a thousand over three years. This hole is designed for three years. Not asking you to do that in one month, not asking you to do it in one year. Whatever your pledge is, it could be done as a one-time gift. It could be divided in three and done yearly. It could be divided by month over 36 months. So that's why we want you to take these home with you. Sit down if you're married. Pray about it. Talk about it. What are you able to do? And when you see it broken down, at least it makes it easier for me to figure out how we can do that. Read the last page there all on your own. It tells you a little bit about the heart of our church and our mission giving and our outreach giving. And then it's a site plan at the very bottom that kind of lets you know where it all is. So um, I would love for you to take these, pray about this, bring your pledge cards back any Sunday you want to between now and November the 25th. That's the last Sunday of the month of November. We would really like to have these in by then. It doesn't mean we won't take pledges after that, but uh, for our initial church family and this beginning launch, this is the target date we would like those returned. You'll either be able to put your cards, just drop them in the offering on a Sunday morning, or we're also going to be providing a box for you in the foyer that you could drop them off at. Um, after next week, you can take and give out brochures to family and friends that maybe New Hope has had an impact on their life and you think that maybe they would like to consider it and you can certainly give those out. Next Sunday, you'll see up on the big screen a short two to two and a half minute video presentation about this project. It will also be on Facebook uh, after next Sunday. So if you wanted to uh, direct it towards somebody on your Facebook list, you would be able to do that. We are choosing not to pay twenty-five to $50,000 to hire professionals to come do a professional fundraising event here. I'm probably largely responsible for that in that I sort of believe that if God approves and God directs, he supplies. And I would rather take twenty-five to $50,000 and do more inside the building than do less. And so uh, I firmly believe that um, that is the direction we need to go at this time. I could be wrong and I will be the first to admit it. Uh, if you could show the picture up there real quick, please. Here's how we're going to keep track with you on a weekly basis of how things are going. Instead of just a thermometer, uh, somebody in our board had a suggestion. That's the church building. It's been divided into 15 sections, $100,000 per section. And so as the pledges come in, we will raise from the bottom up, and we'll cover up the building. When the building's completely covered up, We've had that amount of pledges come in, all right? Uh, you notice that there's almost three full sections filled. We have already received pledges for $290,000. This has come from... This has come from your board and pastoral staff. 
And so uh, it's almost unanimous. We have two that are still uh, deciding what that contribution is going to be. I fully expect it to round out that $300,000 that comes from your board and your pastoral staff. That's 17 members of the church. Um, I will not tell you who, but I can tell you that we've already had uh, one of our members pledge $100,000. We've had another member pledge $50,000. Um, and I know if you look at this on the back, you're saying, oh good, we've already got our one $100,000 person. We don't need another. We will take more than one. This is only a, a perspective, okay? Uh, and you don't have to limit it to 100000 If you wanted to do more, you can. I think that anytime a pastor launches something like this, he needs to be as transparent as he possibly can, and you need to know what Shelly and I have chosen to do at this point. We have made a pledge of $25,000 for the next three years uh, with the hope of doing more during that time. Uh, how are we doing that? Because uh, we don't necessarily make that much. We do well. You have taken good care of us, and for that I'm grateful. But we knew this was coming, and so we've made some decisions preparing for this. Number one is I'm driving an electric car instead of a brand new 4x4 truck. Uh, I still have my 4x4 Explorer with 200,000 miles on it. It sits for only when I need it. I'm paying $59 a month for an electric car. That's what's helping us do this. God intervened in a way that neither one of us imagined. Most of you know we moved last year in September, a year ago last month. That was not on our plan. We were planning on being where we were for five years. Somebody actually knocked on our door, said, we want to buy your house. Um, we looked for a house. We actually have a better house than what we left, but we sold our old house for more than we paid for our new house, and our new house appraises more than the old house did, so our monthly payment is less. God works in mysterious ways. We also are purchasing a miniature donut machine <laughs> because where we move to is the Christmas light area. And so we are going to have a miniature donut machine there that will kick out hot donuts for people walking by on a cold night. And, uh, you know, there's a kid two blocks over who, with churros, has bought a car and paid four years of college with churros. So we thought we would cut in on his action. And uh, we're going to sell some donuts. If anybody wants to volunteer for a night, you can come help us do that. Um, please... I want you to take these home. I want you to pray about this. If you're new here, again, I apologize. I hope you're not feeling, and I hope our own congregation isn't feeling a great deal of pressure. I do believe this is a sacrificial moment for us to consider. What can I do over a three-year period of time? You can begin that three years right now if you want to, or you could start that three years in January. I realize there's a potential that we could carry building debt for about a year. I, I don't want any debt. I would love if it's paid off at the time it's completed. But if we have the pledges in, I'm okay with it going a little after we got started. The flip side is we never know how the county and the city are going to be, and it may take us longer to get started than what we hope for. So, but this is a three-year three commitment. Let me wrap this up with a quote from my dad. If you're new here... My dad was the founding pastor of Memorial Free Will Baptist Church, which is one of the two churches that 26 years ago, this very month, merged together to be the church that we are now. At the time that we merged, we were about 130 people. But in 1965, dad started Memorial Church in Fresno. My dad is still with us. He's in this service. He was in the last service. He will go home, change his clothes, and he'll be back at the end of the next service to greet everybody. My dad's quote two months ago in our board meeting as we finalized these plans was this. I hope I live long enough to see it built. I would suggest to you, let's make it happen. Please take the brochure and the card pray about it. Bring back that pledge card. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact Mark, myself, any member of the board. They would be happy to answer any questions for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you know we haven't entered into this lightly. And Father, we've done our best around New Hope to be a, sa a place that is selfless, not selfish. We're not interested in building buildings for any of our legacies. 
We're interested in building facilities that make a difference for your kingdom work of how we can do more with the resources that you've blessed us with. And so, Father, we believe as we've looked at this from every possible angle, timing, needs, circumstances, that this has been led by you for this point in our life. We simply say thank you in advance for how you will provide exactly what is needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Quick question. And I know that's a lousy question to ask publicly. Did you feel pressured today? Do you feel put upon? Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> you should. That came from Governor Brown. All right. He should. All right. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Have a great day.